and we're going to go, we're going to dive. Everybody say dive. dive. See, when you dive, you know how to dive, right? I mean, you can step into the water and, and, and you're, you know, you can pull it right back out. But when you dive, there's no going back, right? You just get in, right? That's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to dive in to the book of Jonah. We talked about it on Sunday, and it was, it was my mistake. I, for some reason, thought I had 45 minutes to an hour. Okay, I got you. Um, but when I talked with him, he, rem- <laughs> he made it clear. That's not the case on Sunday mornings. You got about 25 minutes. So I, I was like, so I had to really fly through the lesson. Uh, <laughs> I moved at a rapid pace to do, you know, a lot faster than you could do an exhaustive study. I'm sorry. That's right. It is. There's another one right there if you want. Oh, I got you. Okay, so the title of the lesson is Do I See Jonah in Me? And what we, you know, what we talked about on Sunday was the, um, as we're doing this, we're doing this exhaustively. We're taking a good look at a, at a pretty incredible character in the Bible. I mean, most people, even people that are non-Christians, know the story about the guy that got swallowed by a whale. Amen. So this is a pretty iconic story in our culture, in our belief system. We believe in the Word of God. We believe what the Word of God teaches. And so you got this amazing story that includes a character that, uh, that um, a pretty miraculous event takes place in and also... Um, his attitude and his characteristics and his demeanor and how he feels about other people. And we're going to see, you know, by the end of the story, you know, I don't know about you, but uh, there's a scripture where Paul says, I have learned in whatsoever state that I'm in therewith to be content. Now, the key word in that statement is learned. He said, I have learned. Usually by the time you get to be 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, you've learned a few things. You've repeated a few mistakes. You fell down a few times. Some of them were bad. Some of them were, most of them were hopefully minor. But you have learned a few things. And and I don't know about you. I'd rather learn from your mistakes. If I watch you make a mistake, I'd rather, I'd rather you come to me and say, Hey, Brother Cook, by the way, there's a pothole out there. It just tore my tire up. So you might want to go around that thing. And, then, and by, when we look at Jonah's life, we can kind of see some things. And, and, and if we see some of that in us, we can say, Well, okay, I, I need to put my belief system back up on, and, and, and my attitude and my demeanor back up on the table, and maybe I can make some uh, adjustments. So we're going to reread um, Jonah 1 1 just to kind of get us started. And then we're going to charge forward because I really started to skip um, through on, on about page five of these notes, is where I really started to jump forward. So just laying a foundation, Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. One day the Lord spoke to Jonah, and most of my scriptures will come from the Good News translation. One one day the Lord spoke to Jonah, the son of Amittai. He said, go to Nineveh, that great city, and speak out against it. I am aware of how wicked its people are. Now, we talked about sin on Sunday and what is sin. And sin by a biblical definition is simply a miss. God's got a plan, and you are not your own, okay? You are bought with a price. God's got a plan for your life, a path that you should follow, okay? And even if you stray from it, you should be willing to come back to it. Even if you stumble, you should be willing to get back up, because why? He's the shepherd, and we are the lambs, amen? He's the master, 
and we are the servants. So we look to Him for guidance and instruction. And so when we sin, we miss the target. Now, verse 3, Jonah, however, set out in the opposite direction. Okay, now, interestingly enough, most of my mistakes have not been the opposite direction of what God wanted me to do. Usually if I make a mistake, it's because I'm, I'm doing an oblique. Anybody know what an oblique is? It's kind of a, yeah, it's a deviation, not a major deviation. It doesn't take long to get back on course. But it says here that Jonah actually went the opposite direction. And he began to do what we would call run from God. Now, in verse 4, the Lord sent a strong wind on the sea, and the storm was so violent that the ship was in danger of breaking up. And the sailors were terrified and cried out for help, pointed out on Sunday, and I'll point out again. This, this gives us, when you're reading the scripture, I like to look for verifiables. And one of the verifiables here is the sailors were scared. Okay, I mean, this, this kind of verifies the severity of the storm. Most sailors, I know I've been through multiple storms out to sea in the middle of the ocean. It wasn't no big deal. But I can tell you two of them that had every single person on the ship pretty nervous. Okay, they were, they were serious, serious storms. And everybody was, was worried. And this is a situation where... This storm was obviously quite tragic. Um, and of course, Jonah, according to the scripture, was found by the captain sleeping in the bottom of the ship at the bottom of page 2. And then skipping over to page 3 on the notes, he wakes him up and Jonah begins to tell them who he is. Now verse 10 says, Jonah went on to tell them that he was running away from the Lord. The sailors were terrified and said to him that that was an awful thing to do. The storm was getting worse all the time. So the sailors asked him, What should we do to you to stop the storm? Jonah answered, Throw me into the sea, and it will calm down. I know it's my fault that you were caught in this violent storm. Now, this is a scripture that it's, it's, it's really quite amazing when you look at the, the, the Old Testament, I don't know about you. Guess what? I, I just started Jeremiah today. <sighs> it, it's wonderful. I mean it too. It's a wonderful book. Um, Jeremiah is called in Jeremiah 36 to collect his writings. So it's writings and sermons and ministries. And uh, he gives it all to this guy by the name of Baruch to record the book of Jeremiah. But Jeremiah, I think it's chapter 1 to 34, is chewing Israel out. I mean, it's just, it gets exhausting. Because I read the, I read the Bible through uh, uh, chronologically. So, in other words, I'm fixing to just mow through Jeremiah. There's not going to be those little stops in New Testament. It's going to be all Jeremiah for about two weeks. So, or a week, or a week and a half, something like that. But in, in, this, in this writing, in this story... Uh, the Israelites are just exhausting in the Old Testament. You know, it seems like God would redeem them. He pulls them through the Red Sea, and they start complaining. He gives them manna, and they collect too much. He sends them quail, and, and it just seems like every time God would do something incredible and wonderful and miraculous, within a short period of time, they're just back to, to, to backbiting and complaining. And it's, it's actually quite exhausting uh, in, in, from, from my point of view. And in this story, uh, Jonah is, of course, as a Hebrew, he's on the run, he's on the run from God. And, uh, and let's see here. Let me read this again. Yeah, once again, I like to look at what, jo what Jonah is saying. Choices are being made in the middle of the tragedy, and these choices are showing us. Oh, that's, I'm sorry. I almost lost my train of thought. So in the Old Testament, you don't see the characteristics of God being transferred to the people as often as you want. But that's even happening today. I mean, when we, when we receive the Holy Ghost, that is a transformation. Amen? 
And, and we all, I remember, by the way, I remember receiving the Holy Ghost the first time I got the Holy Ghost. I felt lighter. I mean, I literally, physically felt lighter. It was amazing. It was, it was, a, it was a transcendent uh, spiritual thing that took place, and it was, it was a miracle. And I mean, I honestly had no problem with a living soul. When I received the Holy Ghost, I wasn't mad. I wasn't bitter. I was joyful. I was amazed that I could be saved. That salvation was actually real because I had heard about salvation from some pretty bad people. <laughs> oh, that's a surprise? Come on. There's a lot of churches out there that they, they read out of the Bible, but they got some problems. Amen? They have issues. And, and, if, and if you go to one of those churches and you hear them preach and you feel the presence of the Holy Ghost and then you see them gossip and, and mean and nasty, you, you, it can really confuse an individual, especially a young person, right? So I honestly had, had kind of written off this whole salvation thing. But then I got saved and, of course, once you get saved, you got to learn how to live with Christians, Woo, here we go. Because that can be quite challenging sometimes, right? Why? Because we're all imperfect. Amen? Well, in Jonah's characteristics so far, we've already seen that he's a man of God. God is speaking to him. And by the way, he's mentioned in 2 Kings. Jonah is a prophet of renown. And he hears from God. What does he do? He takes off running. And when everybody else is scared to death, where is he at? <laughs> I mean, the Bible says the captain has to wake him up. Hey, man, what are you doing? We're dying. Okay, yeah. And, of course, Jonah comes up, and we see the first glimmer of the character of God show up in him. The first time, he says, you need to, this is my fault. This is my fault. You guys need to throw me over. Now, the Bible goes on to talk about the fact that the sailors don't want to do that. They don't want to do this, and they really try hard not to, and, but there's no way around it. And finally, they repent, and they say, God, don't, don't let this man's blood be on our hands, and they chunk him over in the water. And then, of course, begins the amazing tale um, of Jonah and the well, uh, or fish, Jonah chapter... Um, are still, still verse 17 and the Lord's at the Lord's command a large fish swallowed Jonah and he was inside the fish for three days and three nights now this is an amazing story it's a miracle okay now I said it the other day and I well let me let me let me back up and read a few scriptures before I give my disclaimer here um, Jonah chapter 2 verses 1 through 10 from deep inside the fish Jonah prayed <laughs> okay I mean sometimes it's amazing what it takes to get our attention right amen I, 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 I stand beside this and I, I would encourage you um, if you have lost loved ones if you have lost friends you know, I don't know about you, but I pray for them. And I, I have a three-ring binder. I've got, uh, I've got, I don't, I got most of y'all's names in it. Brother Ray, Brother Roy, Sister, you're, you're, you're in there. I don't know you, Sister. Your name's not in my prayer book. I have to get your name. I can put it in my prayer book. But we pray for each other, right? We pray. Okay, well, listen, my prayers aren't always for your benefit. My prayers for those that are away from God are that they come back. Now, whatever they got to go through to come back, I know is better for them, even if they got to go through hard times. Even if they have to suffer loss. Their salvation is far more important than a college education. Can I get an amen? Their salvation is far more, far more important than their comfort, than their bills being paid, than their air condition being turned on all the time. 
Their salvation is far more important. Sometimes it takes us hitting rock bottom for us to find out that Christ is the rock at the bottom. <laughs> Amen? And so in this scenario, Jonah is in the belly of the well and he begins to pray. And from deep inside the fish, Jonah prayed. And verse 2, in my distress, O Lord, I called to you and you answered me. From deep in the world of the dead, I cried for help and you heard me. Now we are seeing something in this scripture text that is... is as saving grace, nothing moves God like faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And yet, listen to Jonah's phrases. He is saying, I'm in here, but I know you hear me. I'm in this terrible situation, but I know you've heard my, my voice. Verse 3, you threw me down into the depths to the very bottom of the sea where the waters all rolled over me and all your mighty waves rolled over me. I thought I had been banished from your presence and would never see your holy temple again. And page 5 talks about the, the water choking him, the seaweed. And then, of course, uh, verse 7, when I felt my life slipping away, O oh Lord, I prayed to you in your holy temple, you heard me. Now, several times we hear something in, jo in Jonah's prayer that tells us very clearly that he has faith. What did he just say? You heard me. That's what he says. You heard me. I'm, I'm, I'm in the belly of this fish. I, I'm going to be quite frank with you. Man. I mean, don't get me wrong, I would be praying, but there would seem like there would be a lot of panic in there, woven in there, in the belly of an animal in the ocean. Amen? But he's, he's praying, and you can hear faith in the words that he is saying. And there's nothing that moves God, like a broken heart, like a tender heart, and a heart that's full of faith. Matter of fact, in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 32, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Listen to what Jesus said. He's talking to Simon Peter, and he is, he, boy, I tell you what, I'd love for Jesus to just come down and meet with me and say, Mark, I'm praying for you. <laughs> Woo, that's the good stuff right there. He says, Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. Why? Because Jesus knew the quintessence, you're going to stumble. Peter, you're going to fall. You're going to deny me three times. You don't even know it yet. During the worst moments of my life, you're going to deny me. But I prayed for you that when you go through all this, that you hold on to your faith. That that doesn't fail you. Why? Because Jesus knew that's the, that's the quintessential ingredient that will get you through this life, this is a journey, amen? I mean, Jonah, Jonah lived for many years. He had a ministry before this. How long he lived afterwards, we don't know, but he might have lived many years afterwards. But this is only a small section of his life, but I would say it was pretty important. It made it into the, it made it into the Word of God, amen? Verse 10 I'm, I'll, let me go back and read verse 8. Those who worship worthless, worthless idols, once again, this is Jonah, and he is speaking, he's still praying. Those who worship worthless idols have abandoned their loyalty to you, but I will sing praises. Now this is really, he's going from faith and he's talking about praising. In the belly of the well. He's mentioning, I can't, I mean, I, it's hard to even mention that that word would be there while he's still in the well. Now I am I can I can see I can hear him saying praise while he's up on the beach. 
Okay, I, I get that. But in the well, in the well, I have to give him kudos for that. And learn from it. Amen? In the well, he said, but I will sing praises to you. I will offer you a sacrifice and do what I have promised. Salvation comes from the Lord. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah up on the beach, and it did. Now, I, I'm, once again, I'm going to speak this. Not everybody, <laughs> this, is, this is not the most pleasant thing to hear, but it is the truth. The fact that Jonah was well puke instead of well poop was grace. I know that may seem kind of nasty, but the truth of the matter is most of the time when something goes into the mouth of a well, it doesn't come back out its mouth. Amen? <laughs> I know, right, exactly. It's, we're all in the miracle area, right? We're all, we're wandering around in the, in the land of the miracles, amen? So the, God called the fish, but then also, I believe it says it right there, um... And the Lord ordered the fish. Yeah, okay. The Lord ordered the fish. So if the Lord orders it, then it can happen. So the Lord ordered it too, and then we have Jonah up on the beach. Jonah 3, 3 and verse 1. Once again, the Lord spoke to Jonah. And, the word, and then in the King James Version, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. How many is glad that we have a God of multiple chances? Amen? You guys probably only needed two. For me, he has proven he's, he, he's got the two and many, many more. He is a God of multiple chances. Verse 2, he said, go to Nineveh. The message hasn't changed. That great city and proclaim to the people the message I have given you. And verse 3 has something very surprising. surprising. So Jonah obeyed the Lord. <laughs> okay, yes sir, I am going. I mean, who knows, you might have an elephant come and swallow me. I am heading for Nineveh to start preaching. Praise the Lord. And he does. Um, okay, so he goes... So Jonah obeyed the Lord and went to Nineveh. I'm sorry, I had a scripture right in between there from Matthew 21. And went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to walk through it. Jonah started through the city. After walking a whole day, he proclaimed, In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Now, once again, I'm not a fire and brimstone preacher even though I do preach fire and brimstone from time to time. Why? Because the Bible mentions hell three times as much as it do, does heaven. Well, that means something. Amen? If the Bible is willing to talk about hell three times more than heaven, then I'm definitely going to include hell in my preaching. Why? Because we got to we got to avoid hell at all cost. we got to make it to heaven. Jesus said, I have gone to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. Exactly. Amen. And that is our goal. But at the same time, it is unwise to forget what would happen if we didn't follow. There is an alternative. Not choosing is choosing. Amen. Not choosing to follow Christ is making a choice. Choosing to do it poorly, that's between you and God. But once again, it is a very real thing. Hell must be avoided. And Jonah is there to preach, and he's not really pulling the punches. I mean, as far as we can tell, he's not really out to, you know, he doesn't go to their local Starbucks and sit down and order coffee for everybody. And hey, listen, guys, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Jonah. I am from Jerusalem. And I, want, I just want to share a few things with you. You know, I mean, that's kind of how we might do it, right? Why? We want to build up the relationship. But the, the, the truth of the matter is Jonah don't even like him. He doesn't even like him. 
He doesn't even want to be in Nineveh. As a matter of fact, as soon as all the Nineveh, Ninevites are baked, he can head back to Jerusalem and get back to being a prophet. Well, he starts to preach. Verse 5, the people of Nineveh, something amazing happened. The people of Nineveh believed God's message. So they decided that everyone should fast and all the people from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth to show that they had repented. Now Matthew 3 and 8 says, Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. What does that mean? Bring forth fruit. That's a very old English way to say something. I'm, I'm, I read the Good News Translation, NIV usually. The King James can be a little archaic. What does it mean to bring forth fruits, meat for repentance? Anybody? The Good News, you're exactly right. The good news... Go ahead, sister. Here, let me see what y'all think of this. In the good news translation, it says, Do those things that show you have turned from your sins. In other words, do things that show that you're sincere. I can go out partying every night and just stay out all night long and my wife wait up and I'm there and I'm, oh honey, I'm sorry. You know I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to do that again. You know I wouldn't do that again. Next night, go out and do the same exact thing. Come back home, honey, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I just, I won't ever do that again. Go out that night, do the same thing again. What am, what am I missing? I'm saying the words. I'm not changing anything. I'm not bringing forth fruit that shows I'm sincere. I'm not doing anything to let her know I really mean it. Amen? The Bible says bring forth fruit... Do those things that show. And what are the Ninevites doing? Well, here, the king hears about it. In verse 6, when the king of Nineveh heard about it, he got off his throne, he took off his robe, he put on sackcloth, and sat down in ashes. He sent out a proclamation to the people of Nineveh. This is an order from the king and his officials. No one is to eat anything. All persons, cattle and sheep are forbidden to eat or drink. All persons and animals must wear sackcloth. Everyone must pray earnestly to God and must give up their wicked behavior and their evil actions. So what are some of the things that took place? Number one, in verse 5, it says they believed. That's got, it's got to start there. I've seen people try to teach standards to new converts that hadn't received the Holy Ghost yet. What an absolute waste of time. They haven't done a spiritual buy-in yet. You're trying to change them and get them good so that they can get God. Well, that ain't how it works. you got to get God in order to get good. you got to have God in order to feel conviction. You got to have the Holy Spirit working in your life, leading you. See, a person that is hungry for God, it's easy to lead them. You just take them to the Word. Look at what the Word says. Look at what the Word of God has shown us. And that person is easy to lead. Why? Because they've had a trans. They've they've been transformed. They've been transformed. Well, the Ninevites believed. They believed what Jonah had to say. Even as mean and nasty of a way that he said it. They believed. Number two, they fasted and humbled themselves. Number three, from the greatest to the least, even the king. Even the king took off his robe. Bring me a potato bag. Cut a hole in the top of that thing and cut two arms out the side and sew me another one on the bottom. That's where I'm wearing. That's what I'm wearing. 
Amen. Sackcloth. That's basically what it was. The animals had to fast. Never seen that in the scripture before. They're reaching, ain't they? <laughs> donkey's got to be, the donkey's got to go hungry. Well, what, I can imagine the donkey now. What did I do? <laughs> I didn't do what y'all did. Number five, they prayed. Number six, they repented. And number seven, they changed. I heard a, uh, a message, man, an old time Old time Pentecost message. I can't remember what the name of the preacher was. I think of it when I'm driving down the road leaving. But he, he preached a message at conference, East Coast Conference, and the title of the message was change. He didn't give nobody the title until he was halfway through. And he, he, he it was about change. He was using buggy whips. I used wagon wheels the other day. Some things change over time. Amen. We must change. The Bible says we are transformed. Anybody, everybody seen a Transformer? They got the Transformer movies out there. And they're big, I think it's a pickup or an 18-wheeler, and he turns into a robot or something like that. It's a Transformer. We're supposed to be transformed. Who we were is not who we are now. We still have who we are. We still have the same talents and some of the same characteristics. If you were stubborn as a sinner, guess what? You're probably going to be a bit stubborn as a Christian. But you give that stubbornness to God. And you allow Him to use that for His glory. Yeah. Amen? So they had changed. They had gone through all, through all the steps and then we have this beautiful verse, verse 9. Perhaps God will change his mind. Perhaps he will stop being angry and not die. And amazingly enough, this scripture is actually quoted by Jesus. Matthew chapter 12, verse 41, on the judgment day, Jesus speaking, the people of Nineveh will stand up and accuse you. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the Jews. And he is saying they're going to stand up and accuse you because they turned from their sins when they heard Jonah preach. And I tell you that there is something here greater than Jonah. Jesus is standing there quoting what took place in the book of Jonah. He's quoting the fact that the Ninevites, when they heard the preaching, they changed. And here he spent three and a half years with the Jews, and he has made a small congregation, but they're still doing what? Trying to kill him. So he's quoting from the book of Jonah. Verse 10, Good News Bible, God saw what they did. King James Version says it even better in this scenario. And God saw their works. Everybody say works. works. Man, you got a whole world out there telling you that works don't matter. James is saying, you show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Revelations, two different places. The, there was a great throne and everyone was judged according to their works. So when people say works don't matter, they're crazy. Amen? Amen? I don't think, I think y'all's pastor would say it the same way. They're out of their mind. They're wrong. That's false doctrine. Works matter. It starts with faith, but it's got to become works at some point. It starts with faith. Maybe you get saved in your house in a Bible study. You got to show up at church sometime. Amen? You got to join the ecclesia at some point. It starts with faith, but it's got to evolve into works. At some point, you've got to have that spiritual buy-in that translate into a physical difference. Amen? God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that He had said that He wanted to do to them, and He did it not. Somebody tell me, did their works matter? God saw their works, and He changed His mind. He saw... Did he hear them pray? Yes. 
Did he see them put on the sackcloth? Yes. Did he, did, he see, did he see they weren't feeding the animals? Yes. But the Bible says he didn't change his mind until he saw they had turned from the evil that they were doing. And at that point, he said, okay, I've changed my mind. This brings us back to the preacher. I love it. I love the final chapter because we go back to Jonah. Jonah was very unhappy about this and became angry. So he prayed, Lord, didn't I say before I left home that this is what you would do? That's why I did my best to run away to Spain. See, we find out now in, verse, in, in, in chapter 4 why he did what he did in chapter 1. I knew that you are a loving and merciful God, always patient, always kind, and always ready to change your mind and not punish. That's what Jonah knew about God. He knew he was generous and loving and merciful and kind and he did not want them to change. So he didn't want to preach to them. He didn't want to preach to them. He wanted to go to Spain. And he wanted Nineveh to basically be destroyed. Hmm? <laughs> so... Do you see a difference? Let me ask you this. I want some comments on this. Do you see a difference between God's feelings and Jonah's feelings? They're not meshing. They're not jiving, are they? You've got the... the, 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 the and granted, this is Old Testament, and we're going to give him some space there. Amen. He don't have what we call the Holy Ghost. He, he hasn't, Jesus at this point had not died on the cross. The, the veil had not been rent as of yet. And so what we have written on the tablets of our heart, he still had to rely on written in stone, right? But still, you had plenty of people in the Old Testament that were tender and kind and generous, and extremely successful. And then you had other people that were successful, but goodness gracious, old Elijah, he was successful, but he was a smart aleck. Remember when he went to fight with the people at Baal and the altar, and they were cutting themselves, and, you know, he didn't call the ambulance or nothing. He just busted out laughing. Y'all need to shout a little louder. Maybe your God's in the bathroom. Yeah, maybe he's on vacation. You guys need to get with it, boys. He was a smart aleck. But that was a different day and a different hour. But still, we have the character of God that is coming through in this story. It's just not coming, it's not coming through very well in the preacher. Amen? I mean, it's there. We can see in the story the. The, the character of God, but we're seeing in the preacher. What do you see? I mean, the whole, the whole, the title of this is, Do I See Jonah? Dot, 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 dot. That's a pause. In me. What do you see in Jonah at this point? Stubbornness. You should, you should talk. What do you see? Arrogance, unforgiveness, pride, hubris, amen? Certainly had a, 
a, uh, a point of view, you, you do realize, sometimes people I think lose this, and, and if you're not familiar with the word, you can not understand that God loved the entire world and the Israelites were bound by holy obligation to embrace foreigners when they came in. And God told them, don't you forget, you were a foreigner. You didn't have to become a Hebrew to be saved. You just had to follow Jehovah God. Matter of fact, even Philip, remember in the New Testament, the Ethiopian eunuch, what, where was he coming from? He was coming from Jerusalem. He had been there for Passover. He was an Ethiopian eunuch in Egypt, but he had converted to Judaism. He was a believer. Philip met him, taught him the... You know, read him from Isaiah about the Messiah and, and, and baptized him in Jesus' name. He was filled with the Spirit and Philip was taken off. I mean, there, God's always been there for the foreigners. Nineveh is a proof, a, another story of how much God loved all mankind. And he was looking to use his people. Jonah was one of his. And he wanted him to show up in Nineveh with his characteristics, with his love, with his generosity, with his kindness. Well, he showed up with the right message, but he showed up with a horrible attitude. Can I get an amen? amen. Doesn't it sound like it? I mean, he's angry with God. Verse 4, at the top of page 9, The Lord said, What right do you have to be angry? James 1 and 20. Somebody read that for me. Woo, I got that up in my office. Y'all, I got four little ones at the house. I'm 54. I need that scripture hanging on the wall. Amen? Why did you do that? I don't know. You said that the last 785 times that I've asked you that question. <laughs> Got to remember, human anger does not achieve God's righteous purpose. Verse 5, Jonah went out east of the city and sat down. He made a shelter for himself and sat in the shade, waiting to see what would happen to Nineveh. Now, I have to ask you, up to this point, you've seen Jonah's character. What do you think he was waiting for? <laughs> Is there water around here somewhere? Did I bring a water? I thought I brought a water in. That's okay. That's okay. So what do you think he was waiting for? What? I, I think it's pretty clear. Because he's sitting out, huh, sir? Yeah, he's sitting outside of the city, not inside. <laughs> Yeah, if you're going to watch Sodom and Gomorrah, I want to see it on a high-definition screen a long way away. But if I don't have high definition, I'm going to be on a mountain, 10 miles of sea, you know, 10 miles away so I can see it. And that's what he's doing. Amen? He, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah happened in the book of Genesis. That's way back when. So you've got, you've got the, the story now. This is Jonah. This is hundreds of years later. But he knows what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, and it sounds like what God was saying same thing's fixing to happen in Nineveh. So he's fixing to have a front row seat just in case. Just in case. I know they said they repented. I know you said you weren't going to do it. But maybe, maybe. Verse 6, Then the Lord God made a plant grow up over Jonah to give him some shade so that he would be more comfortable. Can you go up? What, what a wonderful God we serve. That's amazing, isn't it? Jonah is sitting there waiting for the destruction of a people that God's already forgiven. He's wanting to see them cook. And God gives him some shade. But let's, let's stay with it, though. There's a lesson coming. Jonah was extremely pleased with the plant. Verse 7, But at dawn the next day, at God's command, a worm attacked the plant and it died. Verse 8, After the sun had risen, God sent a hot, God sent, 
God sent a hot east wind and Jonah was about to faint from the heat of the sun beating down on his head so he wished he was dead. This guy, is a, he, is a, he is a barrel of laughs, isn't he? He says, I am better off dead than alive. So what did God send? God sent the plant. God sent the worm. God sent the hot east wind. It's impossible to figure God out. You know that, right? What does the Bible say? As far as the east is from the west, as far as the, the heavens are from the earth, are my ways above your ways. The whole book of Job. Everybody talks about Job never sinned against God. Yeah, that lasted about two chapters. He didn't sin, but he sure got, whoo, he, he got into complaining now. I mean, he got into some heavy, do matter of fact, commanded God to come down and tell him what he did wrong. Commanded God. And God showed up. Yeah. Thank you, sister. God showed up. And he begins to go over the reality of the situation. Um, I know where every meteorite is. I know where every planet is. I know the temperature of, of Mars right now. And I know every feather on every sparrow on the planet. I know every grain of sand. I know everything that's going on in hell. I know everything that's going on in heaven. I know everything that's going on in earth. You haven't got a clue on why I am doing what I am doing. And you're never going to. And you know what Jonah said when God got done talking? He said, I should have shut my mouth. I spoke when I should have been quiet. I spoke about things that were above my head. That's what Jonah said. He said, I, sh I should have never said any of those things. What a wise thing to say. Because <laughs> he was right. You ain't going to figure God out. And in this scenario, God sent the plant. That's interesting. God sent the worm. That's even more interesting. And God sent the east wind. <laughs> What's going on? And, and who's he dealing with? He's dealing with a stubborn Hebrew preacher. Now, I want us to discuss how pliable, moldable, and sweet-spirited Jonah has now become. We can't really have that discussion, can we? Unfortunately, we just don't have, we just don't have access to that. Um, unfortunately, the story comes to its conclusion. Verse 10, the Lord said to him, The plant grew up in one night and disappeared the next. You didn't do anything for it? I love that. I believe in hard work. But let me tell you how I pray every morning. God... If you don't get involved in my life today, it's going to be a wreck. If you don't help me, I'm going to fail. You know me. You know me better than I know myself. Now I can go out there and I can work hard all day long and I might mess it all up. So I need you to be up to your eyeballs in my life all day today. You can pray different, but that's how I feel. I need God in everything that I do. And here's what God is saying. You didn't do anything for it. And you didn't make it grow. Yet you feel sorry for it. How much more then should I have pity on Nineveh? That great city. After all it has more than a hundred. This is the size of that city. It has more than a hundred and twenty thousand innocent children. Jonah come on. Come on, Jonah. They may not look like Hebrew kids. They may not talk like Hebrew kids. They may not act like Hebrew kids. But come on. Those are kids, Jonah. If a kid can't touch your heart, right? If a child can't touch your heart, Jonah, you need, you need to go back to the altar for a little bit. Amen? 
2 Peter 3 and 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing... I love this. Not willing that any should perish. It's not God's will. The, 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 the cross was enough to cover from Adam to the last child that was born today to the last child that will be born in the end time, the last day, the day of the rapture. There's enough, there's enough saving power there on the cross to save every single person. Why? Because it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Repentance is a key. Repentance. People say, um, what's the first step? I've heard people say repentance, the first step to salvation. It's not really true. The first step is faith. You, you must first believe that God is and that He is a rewarder. Why repent if you don't believe? You ever pray with somebody at the altar? I have prayed with people at the altar while they were praying and God spoke to me and said, they don't believe I'll root for you. And you know what I prayed? I said, Father, fill them with understanding. Give them understanding because they're beating themselves up and they're not allowing your mercy to come in and have its perfect work in their life. It's God's will that all would come to repentance. Do you see Jonah in you? I saw him in me. I did. I, I mean, I'm not his twin. Thank you, Jesus. But I mean, I, I could see. I saw places in me that I could put back up on the table you know you got to do that every once in a while right if you if you ain't dead you ain't done right amen uh who was it Josiah Josiah that I don't I, I, I believe he was saved but his last 10 years were a tragedy most of his life he lived in a, a great life but his last 10 years were the worst 10 years. The last 10 years that God, or 7 years, that God gave to him. They were a gift. And yet he, 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 he did horror. He did bad things towards the very end. Solomon, come on. The wisest man that ever lived. 700 wives, dude. 700? Come on, man. 700? Yeah. You didn't think that one through. Let's all stand. I think if we, if we look at it, if, we, if we're honest with ourselves, we can, we, can take the neg- we can take the biblical characters. David, we see good, we see mistakes. Moses, we see good. One of the saddest scriptures in the Bible is at the end of Deuteronomy when Moses goes back to God and he says... You know, I've led these people this far. And God had already told him he couldn't go, you know, because he hit the rock. But then he says, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, can I go? And God says, no, and don't ask again.